Hello, I'm Vivian Williams. December 23rd marks the 40th anniversary of the National Cancer Act of 1971. The bill signed by President Nixon strengthened the National Cancer Institute and helped establish much of the funding and research infrastructure required to mount a national effort against cancer. And I'm talking with Mayo Clinic Dr. James Engel today. He's the director of the Mayo Clinic Breast Cancer Spore, a specialized program of research excellence. He's also the program director of the Women's Cancer Program of the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Engel. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I want to start the conversation by uh, talking about your experience back in the 70s with, with what was happening with this bill. Well, as you said, uh, 40 years ago, this Friday, Richard Nixon uh, signed the National Cancer Act of 1971. And it really had a major impact on cancer research and uh, eventually cancer care in the United States. You know, Back then it was said, you know, the U.S. split the atom, put a man on the moon, so let's cure cancer. Well, cancer's been a little bit more of a tough nut to crack. But I do remember that very well, and I was uh, fortunate enough to go to the National Cancer Institute for training in 1973. And a number of things happened in, uh, during that uh, period of time that really radically changed breast cancer perception by women in the country, uh, um, early detection. And the first was uh, about several weeks after Gerald Ford became president, his wife, the first lady, developed breast cancer. And she had a mastectomy. And one thing about Betty Ford, she was very open. And whether this was a reaction to the Watergate uh, uh, scandal, she said, this has to be totally uh, communicated to the country. And so she had her mastectomy. Then two weeks later, uh, the uh, wife of the vice president, Happy Rockefeller, had breast cancer. Now, I was just down the road from Washington in Bethesda, and you can imagine the reaction when the president and vice president's wife get breast cancer. All of a sudden, people started talking about breast cancer. Before then, you know, breast cancer wasn't something you talked about openly. And what we saw was a marked increase, awareness of breast cancer. And uh, with the support of the National Cancer Act, there were new cancer centers. As a matter of fact, Mayo Clinic Cancer Center was started in 1973 with support from the National uh, uh, Cancer Act. The third thing that happened in 1974 was a woman, Rose Kushner, developed breast cancer. Now, Rose Kushner is, should really be credited with uh, advocacy and, uh, and speaking out for women with breast cancer. Because the management of breast cancer in 1971 and seven, in the early 70s was markedly different than it is today. Uh, and I can go into that if you'd like I would to tell like you to about that. In those days, um, a woman with a lump in the breast would go see her doctor, usually a man. There weren't many female surgeons at that time. And uh, they'd say, well, we ought to take you to the operating room. We'll do a biopsy. And if there's a cancer there, we'll do a radical mastectomy. And so a woman would go be put to sleep with anesthesia and not know whether she was going to awaken with a major operation on her chest wall or not. So the biopsy was done at the same time as the operation? Uh, same time as the huh. operation. And Rose Cushion was the first one to say, you know, this is not right. Women have to have a role in their management. They have to understand. They have to have time to think about this. And, you know, there was this sense that uh, there was this urgency to do the operation. Well, you know, a breast cancer that's uh, 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 an inch or so in diameter has probably been around for five plus years. And what Rose Kushner said was, we ought to do the biopsy, see if it's cancer, and then let the woman think about what, she, what needs to be done. And so what we've seen here is the major change, a major change in the past 40 years is that women are very much involved with their care, which is appropriate. Uh, they're a part of the decision-making process. The 
the concept of the two-step approach. That is, you do the biopsy first to find out if, if there's really cancer there. Then you talk about what needs to be done. And that's become very well accepted. Today, women are fully informed and they're a part of the decision-making process, what happens to them, which is the appropriate way to proceed. Well, if you look back, as I said, in the early 70s, the standard treatment was a radical mastectomy. So if a woman had breast cancer, the cancer, uh, not only would the cancer be removed, but the breast would be removed, the nodes in the armpit, and also the major muscles, called the pectoralis major muscle on the, on the chest wall, was also removed. That could be a very disfiguring uh, undertaking. And sometimes it was more than needed to be done. Uh, and sometimes it was, even doing that wasn't enough to cure the woman. What we have seen over the past uh, uh, four decades is a, a uh, tremendous change in the way we do things. Uh, it was by the end of the decade of the 70s that people started understanding you don't have to do this major operation. Then the modified radical mastectomy came in, which was removing the breast, the armpit, lymph nodes, but leaving that big muscle on the chest so that there was still that uh, muscle, there wasn't the deformity. Then research was done that said, well, maybe you don't have to remove the breast. Maybe you can do breast conservation therapy. And so a number of clinical trials were done, randomized trials, uh, which showed that you could, in selected women now, you could remove the cancer, then give radiation therapy, and that gave as good a results as doing these more major operations. Now things have continued to evolve to uh, today where in many women, uh, uh, we give medicines first called neoadjuvant therapy to try to shrink that cancer down uh, before we do any surgery. So things have changed quite a bit. And I want to back up a minute because you said back in the 70s if a woman found a lump, how would you even find a lump? Were there any screening things going on back then? I mean, was, was there a mammography? Were there the self-breast exams? And what um, that's a very good point. It was back then there wasn't the screening. And it was primarily because of increased awareness of breast cancer. And I think it was really uh, brought about by, as I've said, the president and vice president's wife having it, and much more open discussion. And screening mammography came into play. And uh, so if you look at how we've done with breast cancer, things have really improved. The if you look at the uh, mortality due to breast cancer, it increased, continually increased, up until about 1989. And it was in the decade, the 80s, that screening mammography became much more uh, commonly employed. So cancers were being found at an, a much earlier, earlier stage. Uh, as I've said, the death rate, mortality rate in breast cancer increased. It was a small amount, 0.4%. That's not very much, but it's continually increasing in a very, very common uh, disease. Then if you look at the curves for breast cancer mortality, an amazing thing happened. In about 1989, 1990, the curve started going down. So if you look at the average decrease in mortality over the past, since 1990, it's averages 2.2% per year which is an amazing decrease. And I've done some calculations looking at, at the curves. The death rate due to breast cancer, if things continue downward, will be half in 1920, I'm sorry, 2020, than it was in 1990, which is, you know, we'd like it to totally go away, but those are major, major advances things are just so much more hopeful now than they were 40 years ago. Exactly. The uh, National Cancer Institute has estimated that there are 2.6 uh, million women alive right now with breast cancer. And in addition to the change in the surgery uh, since uh, President Nixon signed the act, there have been multiple other changes. If you look at the type of therapies, uh, and well, let's talk about clinical research that was done in the early 70s. It was primarily trial and error. 
over the, these decades, uh, we've seen doctors become uh, much more, uh, much smarter. Uh, uh, <laughs> that is because the doctors in the clinic work with the doctors in the laboratory. And you mentioned the Breast Cancer SPORE, the Specialized Program of Research Excellence. That's an NIH grant for translational research. So translational research is that you, you do studies in the laboratory to try to understand the biology of the cancer, identify targets uh, for the cancer, uh, try different therapeutic strategies, and once you find something that makes sense and looks really good, then you can take it in the clinic. So you're translating that into the clinic. That's been the major change over the past uh, uh, 40 years. The way we approach research now is much different than it was 40 years ago. Uh, in day-to-day -day practice, there have been really impressive advances. You know, most of the drugs that we use today weren't even around 40 years ago. And uh, in hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, we've shown real advances for women diagnosed with breast cancer. Take women with early breast cancer. Tre uh, most have a uh, called estrogen receptor positive disease. Tamoxifen, which was a new drug that we actually did the first study here in the late 70s, a randomized study showing that it was better than the prior treatment that was used, uh, has been shown with long-term follow-up that five years of taking this tamoxifen pill will reduce the risk of recurrence by half and decrease death rates by a third, just taking that one little pill. There are multiple chemotherapies which continue to get better, and it's been shown with uh, examination of the worldwide studies that you can reduce uh, death rates by half. Radiation therapy with newer techniques, newer approaches, can improve survival. So these are all changes that we use every day in the clinic now that weren't available 40 years ago. And it seems like, you know, whenever you read a health newsletter or something, there's always something new, new research that's coming out about breast cancer, ways to make the drugs more effective for different types of breast cancer. What are the, the new things that are coming on the horizon that are really exciting as far as research? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the most exciting thing is our ability with new technologies to examine a patient's cancer for the genetic derangements that make it the cancer. Because cancer is a genetic disease. There's mutations in the cancer and uh, it allows it to grow unrestrained and uncontrolled. And uh, with the techniques that are available now, we're starting to go in and examine that cancer, find out the mutations that are there with the goal of identifying targets that you can go in and, and if, the, if one gene's overactive, if you can go in and attack that gene and turn it off. So that's very, that's very exciting. And matter of fact, at, at Mayo, we are just about to activate a study. It's called BEAUTY, Breast Cancer Genome Guided Therapy Study, uh, where we're going to, uh, uh, as a part of the uh, Center for Individualized Medicine uh, program, we're going to take a patient's tumor, a newly diagnosed breast cancer, and do what's called genome-wide sequencing of that cancer. We're going to be able to see all the mutations. Because everybody's different, we, you and I handle drugs differently, and uh, other, uh, it's not just a gender issue, but we handle drugs differently, we're going to be able to look across the uh, normal uh, genome of, of a patient to see how they handle drugs. And we're going to bring those two together to identify the best treatment. That's personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, how will things look in a decade? At the 50 years of uh, the National Cancer Act, I think it will, the way we approach things We've gotten a glimpse at the way it will be, but the way we approach things will be unrecognizable. I really think that a patient that comes in with uh, breast, whether it's breast cancer or another cancer, heart disease, uh, whatever, they'll come in with their genome on, whether, whether it's a credit card or a USB stick, it'll come in and it will help the doctors really personalize the care of that patient. 
And this could solve the problem of why one person responds to chemo and the other doesn't. Variability is, mm -hmm. is an absolute truism. You can have two patients that look exactly the same. They respond differently to any form of therapy. Uh, 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 the tumor responds differently. So you're right. So this, the, the National Cancer Act of 1971 um, kind of prompted a huge change in the treatment of breast cancer. And any sort of closing comments for women who might be diagnosed as far as the, the hope that's out there really for, for them? You know, I think there is real hope. The important thing is to try to diagnose things early. That's where mammography and annual uh, physician, physician examination, or healthcare provider examinations of the breast is, is really important. And that we have a number of different treatments and that offer real potential for value to that patient. So uh, there's a reason to be hopeful about uh, uh, treatment of breast cancer. Well, thank you, Dr. Ringel, for joining us today. And it's been a pleasure to talk about how the treatment of breast cancer has changed since 1971. My pleasure, thank, thank you. you.